There's a storm heading our way, and it's set to bring a wintry mix of rain and sleet to the city, but no snow here in town. What's going on with that? With more on what we can expect over the next 12 or so hours and how climate change is affecting winter weather across New England, we're really pleased to have with us meteorologist and GBH contributor Dave Epstein. Hi, Dave. Hello, John. Good to be here with you. Good to have you here. I'm not a big snow guy, I freely admit it, but I feel the pain of skiers and kids who want snow days and sledding and so forth. But we just can't seem to get it together to get snow in here in, in, in the immediate Boston area, and I guess the next 24 hours are the same deal, right? Yeah, that's right. This storm system looks like it's just too warm. We will have some sleet pellets around this evening uh, in Boston mixed with the rain at times, but certainly not going to accumulate. And then once the rain area moves to the north, we'll get some colder air in here tomorrow. I do think we'll see some snow showers. Could amount to a coating to an inch during the day tomorrow. Now, north of, say, the Mass Pike and certainly around the Route 2 and the border towns of New Hampshire, we could see anywhere from one to maybe three inches right along the New Hampshire border. But I think you're really going to have to flip into New Hampshire in Maine before we start seeing three to six inches. And that's mostly tonight, uh, a little bit additional tomorrow for those folks. But for, for what you're seeing there, most of that comes overnight tonight into very early tomorrow morning. Is this going to make the skiers happy, Dave? Uh, it'll make them happier. Certainly there uh, has been a, uh, you know, a dearth of less snow than usual up there. So we do need some snow, uh, but anything helps and it will make skiing a little bit better, especially in the southern ski areas of New Hampshire and Maine. And then I understand there's a couple more storms coming down the pipe. What's up with those? Yeah, we have another storm system coming in Sunday night and Monday. Uh, again here, I think along the coastline, we're going to be hard-pressed to see much in the way of snowfall. It doesn't mean we can't. You know, the, the track of that we're talking here on Thursday, the track of that can definitely change. So we'll see what happens for that. And then another one, sometime I think Wednesday night and Thursday, and that one again, uh, going to be a lot of moisture with it. But the question is, is will there be cold in southern New England? Northern New England, all three of these systems should add some good snow depth for northern New England, and they could really use it up there. So that's the good news. Well, as I said, you know, to me, this is ideal. The snow where it's needed, up north, out west, in the ski hills, not so much here in the city where I'm trying to get my car out of the driveway. But that's just me, and I know I, I don't speak for everybody. Uh, Dave, you recently told Paris and Jeremy on GBH Radio's Morning Edition that warm winters, like the one we've been experiencing here, will, quote, continue to be more the norm. And the staff here at Greater Boston pulled some uh, statistics we'd like to show our viewers to kind of illustrate that. Take a look at the increase in average winter temperatures since 1970 around New England. Three degrees in Boston, ranging up to 7.1 degrees in Burlington. Now, to a layman, that might not look like much, but uh, those are major shifts in, in Burlington. My goodness, they're, uh, they must be walking around in thongs uh, in January and February. Yeah, it is incredible. I think it's hard for most folks that don't kind of deal with these kind of numbers on a day-to-day -day basis to really understand that one degree, one and a half degrees is a big deal in terms of moving averages. And, you know, and the reason why it's such a big deal is those numbers are based on 30 years worth of data. That's not like just one or two winters. So over 30 years, that's a lot of days. It's a lot of winters. And to move seven degrees, it's incredible, but it does follow what most of the global climate, global climate models say, and that the, the biggest change is going to be the further north you go. So the Arctic is seeing the greatest warming, and that is why the further north you go here in New England, we're seeing more warming. So the impact is definitely felt here in Boston. You move further south, there's still impact around the D.C. area, Washington, uh, New York, Philadelphia, but the impact really is showing up a lot more here in New England. Yeah, and nationally, let's take a look at a map we put together here. This is kind of an eye-opener. See that dark red that runs from the East Coast all the way, boy, uh, all the way to the upper Midwest and beyond? Uh, that's warming of three degrees or more. So there's really no escape from this, uh, is there, Dave? No, no, there's really not. And, and I think one of the things that people kind of sometimes fail to understand is that when we talk about climate change and we talk about the global climate changing, we're not talking about the fact that every single winter is going to be warm without snow. Sure. As a matter of fact, 
warm air actually holds more moisture than cold air. And so when it is cold enough to snow, some of those snowstorms could be absolutely huge. I mean, we saw that back in 2015 with the 90 inches of snow in a very short amount of time. And some of that had a little bit of the climate change fingerprint on it. It's, and it, it's basically saying, what are the odds that these things would happen had humans not put all the CO2 into the atmosphere over the past 150 years? And so we will have winters that are cold. We will have winters that are very snowy. But the odds of having a winter like we're experiencing now will tend to increase over the coming decades. And by mid to late century, we'll see fewer winters with a lot of snow and more winters like we're experiencing right now. Uh, boy, Dave, I was having so much fun talking with you. And then you mentioned the winter of 2015. And <laughs> now I feel myself sliding into a deep funk. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to soldier on here. You mentioned uh, moisture. And after last summer, where we had drought conditions from border to border here in Massachusetts, along with record-breaking heat, that's obviously uh, a chronic concern. Uh, is it something that's going to be just a part of, uh, of, of, of the cycle here? Yeah, so droughts have been really common in New England for, for you know, in perpetuity, we've had droughts. You go back to the 1960s, we had droughts. You go back further than that, we had droughts. And we our droughts here are not like the West. We're not going to experience, just because of the way that the planet is, the jet stream, even with climate change, we're still going to have plenty of rain. We're not going to run into issues like we've seen out in California, Arizona, places like that. But as the climate warms, uh, a drought that, say, took place in 1960, 64, with the temperatures back then... The exact same drought in 2023, 2030, 2040 would have more impact because it's warmer. So you could have the exact same amount of rain or the exact same rain deficit that we had 50 years ago, but because it's warmer, the impact to crops, to uh, wells, uh, to infrastructure that needs water is greater because of the warming. Wow, you know, there are consequences to all of this. I mean, people who live along the coast are well aware of it. They don't need you or I to tell them. But uh, I, I personally experienced one that I never expected. A couple of years ago, I was spending some time down in Wellfleet, and I take my dog out to do her business, and uh, immediately am voraciously attacked by mosquitoes, blood running down my legs. The dog is being eaten alive. And that was the summer where a, um, a series of unusually high tides breached one of the bay beaches in Wellfleet and created the perfect breeding conditions mm. for a voracious breed of Atlantic Coast mosquito that had never been experienced in town before. It nearly killed the tourism industry. Are those kinds of things going to be happening more and more, or, or was that a fluke? No, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I'm actually teaching a course in meteorology this month up at Colby College, and we had Nick Record from Bigelow Labs, which is up in Booth Bay on the coast of Maine, come in and talk to us yesterday. And one of the things that he was talking about and, and was these algae blooms that were occurring in the Gulf of Maine, one of the fastest warming bodies of water, not in New England, but on the entire planet. And these are types of algae that we had never seen before. And they end up here. And we see jellies that we had never seen before. And they end up here. And so you start experiencing things like you experienced, you know, bugs in areas that were not there before. And then those mosquitoes, of course, can carry diseases. And so, you know, we see change. Change is inevitable. But these changes are more rapid. And they are in some ways unprecedented and bring in things that just have not been observed in the, you know, the history of uh, us as humans observing what's going on. Wow. Well, we're down to our final minute here, Dave, but I wanted to tell you when I knew I was going to be talking with you, I went on your Twitter feed, and there at the top of it, you pinned a tweet, uh, apparently uh, to try to deflect, uh, I guess, a high volume of tweets, you comments you get from climate change deniers, where you called them misinformed and filled with poor ideas. How big a, how big a hassle is that? How much do you get that kind of feedback. I'm, I mean, I do get it a lot. And I think, and, and the reason I use the term misinformed is that I don't want to use other language that kind of demeans people. And I think that people can educate themselves as to exactly what's going on. And yes, the climate's been changing. And yes, we've had different climates in the past. But what humans are doing 
is exacerbating the climate. And we are pushing the climate in the same way that a person could have worked out for 100 years, but then they take steroids and now they can do things they couldn't do before. The climate's doing things it wasn't doing before because humans are adding CO2 and that's the steroid for the atmosphere. Dave, thanks. We'll look forward to hearing you on GBH's Morning Edition. Always good to be with you, John.